Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Our theme for tonight's program is seeing through the right lenses. Now this, we use this analogy, which was my guest's idea for the program, Patty Bonds. It was her idea to express the fact that many of us though we think we're seeing, let's say, what Scripture says or what maybe what life is about, we may be blinded by the lenses that we are wearing, the lenses of our, our tradition, the lens of our experience, the lenses of our culture, the lenses of our family, uh, will, might paint the way that we interpret and accept things, and we may be blind to that. And part of conversion involves seeing that blindness. Sadly, we're warned in Scripture in 1 John when he warns that some people are blinded by the darkness. How are we blinded by the darkness? Seems like we're blinded by bright light, but yet darkness can blind us, can twist us to missee things. And so part of our conversion as we seek to follow Jesus is to ask him through the work of the Holy Spirit to take the scales away from our eyes so that we can see clearly. Our guest this evening, Patty Bonds, is going to talk to us about her journey of faith, journey into the Catholic Church, and I need to tell you something about Patty. Patty, you may not recognize the name Patty, but if I told you the name of her brother, you would probably recognize. She's the sister of a, a prominent, well-known, uh, anti-Catholic apologist. If I mentioned his name, many of you would be familiar with his books and tapes. And I would say that in that sense, uh, Patty's conversion to the Catholic Church uh, was very difficult for her because of those pressures uh, being the sister of a well-known apologist. Uh, so we need your prayers tonight. This can be a difficult time, but she's here to share her journey. You're an important part of this program uh, every week. So if you have a question for us, call us at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Patty, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. You've been a part of the Coming Home Network's uh, discussion group. Uh, about a year. About a year, and uh, that was helpful for you in your journey? Oh, tremendously, tremendously. They're, they're like a family, very prayerful, thoughtful people who are very supportive, and uh, many of them very well read, so it was very useful for questions and, and answers and guidance. Well, in essence, that discussion group email discussion group uh, that's a part of our helpers network of the coming home network is made up of converts all right. over the country actually around the world helping converts in a, a, a non-judgmental uh, non-pushy way it's always our goal in the coming home network has always been never to push pull or prod everyone <laughs> but to, anyone but to let the spirit right. all right which i never was well good i'm good at, i'm glad to i'm glad to know it, it works because oh, yes. the staff is the one that runs that but yeah. uh, but let's hear about your journey let's begin as we usually do every week and have you give us uh, some of your spiritual background i was born and raised in a baptist family very staunchly baptist um, my father has been my pastor a good bit of of my life and uh, as a wee little girl i remember sitting on the front pew and my mother playing the organ and my father preaching and and that was, uh, that was my heritage of, of being raised in, in a church. And I loved Jesus from a, a very little girl. And mm -hmm. I can remember learning the basic tenets of the gospel as, as we understood it and reciting them back to my parents, much to their glee. And, and um, when I was six years old, I made what we refer to as a profession of faith. I prayed with my father and asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And, and uh, later, about a well, less, just a little less than a year from then, uh, he baptized me, and uh, I enjoyed a rich heritage of, of much scripture mm -hmm. and uh, much appreciation of, of God's word and and what it meant to be a Christian. And uh, and I'm very thankful for for all of that. It's mm -hmm. been um, it's saved me from an awful lot of. Uh, um, pitfalls in my life and uh, given me a, a great start and I'm very thankful for it. You also mentioned something to me earlier that uh, with that foundation of your commitment to Christ, surrender to Christ, baptism and, and through all that training, yet later on you had kind of another deepening of that faith Absolutely. where we came to a, a commitment to discipleship. Would you talk right. about that? Right about 95, um, I had developed some bitterness over some things I'd been through and, and um, I think God decided it was time that I, I did business with him and, and um, really dig deep. 
And so he really challenged me with uh, would I be willing to, to follow him in a deep commitment. And at first that meant um, forgiving and, and um, learning how to examine my own conscience and um, just a real cleaning up of relationships and, and following him in every detail of life, not just um, biblical know-how or, or no. you know, theological know-how, but in my everyday relationships, was I willing to follow him? And uh, some of that was very tough and very frightening. And uh, so it was real, really a call to discipleship. Will you make an unconditional surrender of your life in every aspect and follow me no matter how it hurts? And I did, and the result of that, um, my life first came out of that period, and it's John 14, 21, and it basically says that if we, if we know his commandments, if we know his precepts, and we follow them, we enjoy his love, and he discloses himself to us, mm -hmm. which means we, we gain a deeper and deeper knowledge of him. He shows us his true self um, in ways that those that don't want to follow him don't, aren't privileged mm -hmm. to see. And uh, I found that to be true. The more I obeyed, the more I followed, the deeper I knew him. And um, I, I felt uh, the particular uh, church I was going to at the time, which uh, was a wonderful church, and, and I, I owe them much as far as having taught me um, what it meant to follow Christ. But um, we kind of saw ourselves, I think, uh, as being the the very few people in the world who really understood God uh, properly and His Word properly. Did you use the word remnant? Oh yes, okay. yeah. Uh, we were very Calvinist Baptist and, and uh, saw ourselves as the, that chosen few who really understood Him well. Okay. And it was a very narrow world. Mm -hmm. uh, very in a sense, your small group of believers, based on the idea of Scripture alone, Right? Absolutely. As the foundation, yet on top of that, believe that your small group had the one true. Yes. Under, would that be a caricature, or would that be a clear way of? No, that's right? that's definitely true. Okay. Uh, even other Pro you know, Protestant groups were not were not viewed as as having um, the fullness of truth that we enjoyed, and uh, so that was um, okay. very selective group, very small group, and very narrow. And I felt very honored to be part of that. I was overwhelmed with gratitude that. Mm -hmm. uh, that I was part of that little group, and um. you know, every week we have the chance of, of introducing converts and reverts to the audience, and I, I hope the audience, after seeing, I know I know some in the audience who've told me they've taped every program we've ever, <laughs> you know, they've seen every Journey Home, and and what I find fascinating often is when I hear the stories, you see this parallel work of the Holy Spirit, and the one thing that already I see in as you tell your story is the second conversion mm. that the Catholic spiritual writers always talk about, this mm -hmm. need for the second conversion, the second awakening, where the first conversion really is baptism, we accept the Lord as an, as an adult or we're baptized, but there needs to be this hunger and thirst mm -hmm. for righteousness. Exactly. And the Catholic writers ca call it a passive work, which means it's something that the Holy Spirit does to you, mm. awakening your heart. Is that the right. way that you would describe that oh, change? Yeah. And the, the change was that I described as my world went technicolor. It went from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Yeah. It went from black and white to technicolor. And, and my relationship to God just blossomed. And I had the kind of relationship with him where it was like a conversation back and forth, mm -hmm. um, day in and day out. I, I described it as being wrapped in the billows. You know, in Isaiah 6, it talks about his temple filling, filling the, the his, his train, filling the temple. And I, I saw myself like wrapped up in that train and just uh -huh. so close, like, a, like under a bird's wing. It was, it was a wonderful time. It was a very wonderful time. Well, if you look back at that time, our theme for tonight is seeing through the right lenses. Mm -hmm. If you look back at that time, would, was there any question in your mind whether you were looking through the right lenses when it came to understanding Scripture or the, the call of Christ? No. No, I was quite certain I, would, I had been gifted with, with the truth. All right. Okay. At the time, did it bother you at all that the, the, that the Lutheran Church in the corner believed differently, or the Presbyterian, or the, <laughs> an, even another Baptist? I mean, did that ever cross your mind? That well, like I said, I, I kind of was just very thankful okay. that, that I was one of the chosen few who, who understood better than they did. And I even questioned their salvation, yeah, you know, okay. many of those groups. That if they don't understand the way I understand, then, you know, it's real questionable about whether they're even 
uh, saved. Did you, um, Henry, John Henry Newman makes this statement that everyone must have their pope. Mm. And at the time, I'm sure you saw scripture as the foundation, but in any way did you recognize that your little group of people was actually following the interpretation of an individual? Yeah, we were very, very um, Calvinist in our leanings. Um, not entirely, of course, because Calvin believed in infant baptism and we didn't, we right. didn't go there, but um, very, very Calvinist. And in fact, um, much of the teaching we did uh, was involved in our counseling ministry, and much of the teaching we did when we discipled people was based on Calvin's writings. And, hmm. And uh, we saw the world through, through those the lenses. Yeah. All right, very good. Because that's even interesting, and you, whether you saw it at the time or not, and that is, it's one thing to say you thought, saw Calvin, but you know, there's the John Knox view of Calvin, and then there's uh, mm -hmm. other teachers that have a different, you know, a four-point Calvinist, a five-point yeah, Calvinist, yeah. or, uh, I mean, even that, there are Calvinistic groups that won't even speak to one another because they I'm have a sure. different understanding of, of to what extent we're totally depraved or whether... Uh, what kind of, who's saved? Did Jesus right. die for everyone or only a, la right. a limited? I mean, it's a, I, I was a five point Calvinist. Yeah, you know, okay, you, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. All right, in the midst of that, uh, whatever, open <laughs> your, especially, whatever open your heart to the church, especially when you have such a vehement uh, sibling who's anti Catholic. In fact, let me ask you that. You didn't talk about this. To what extent yeah. were you, oh, yeah. where was the church, Catholic church in your life up to that point? Well, um, I remember as a child, um, my dad taught the most dynamic uh, series of lessons on Revelation. I mean, it, it was kind of like the Star Wars of our time. I couldn't wait till every <laughs> Sunday night because um, he really could make it come alive, and, and I looked forward to every Sunday night sermon. And, but part of those sermons was his belief that the Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon and, and that the Pope would be the Antichrist. And I internalized that immediately. I mean, when your parents are are Christian leaders and you know they are, you tend to, you know, and I want to make something really clear too, is that I don't blame my parents right. for what they believe because they too were taught by people who were taught by people who were taught. This goes back a long ways. Right. Um, That's right. People who, and that really is the, the struggle with, with looking, the, the checking whether we are looking through the right lenses because often what we were taught was taught by very sincere, mm -hmm. charismatic, Absolutely. loving, deeply believers. Right. Believe, and, and I know that from my own experience of things. I mean, I actually know people who are pro-choice, not because they've ever really thought it out, but because the person that most influenced them in their life was pro-choice. Mm. And therefore, they will be pro-choice because this, but they never take the chance to right. examine why they believe that. Why is that? So, okay, given all that background, your anti-Catholic background, not just Very. your past, but the, the, the constant influence <laughs> of your sibling, uh, whatever opened your heart to the Catholic Church? Well, um, my daughter, uh, Kimberly, my oldest, was uh, homeschooled for uh, the second semester of eighth grade. And we had homeschooled previously, but uh, she had gone back to school and then, um, had some conflicts with some things at school and had come home for the second half of eighth grade. And she was a bit bored with American history and asked if we could take some time out and study our Scottish-Irish heritage. Well, I was very interested in that too, always had been, and I said, oh, that would be fun. So yeah, finish what you're on and then we'll, we'll do that. So as kind of field trips in February, we went to the Highland Games, which is a Scottish outing and, and um, fairly Presbyterian in its, <laughs> in its <laughs> orientation and, and was, was fine, very comfortable. We had a real strong sense of belonging there. Then the next month we went to uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> and the first, different. <laughs> very different. Uh, first person down the road was Bishop O'Brien. And shortly after that was Father, and I don't, I apologize to him, I don't remember his name. And uh, after that came the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> and at this point I'm looking at my daughters and going, why are we here? And I feel like it's the who's who of Catholicism in Phoenix. <laughs> I was just, just really felt uncomfortable. And before the parade was over, of course, a man dressed in, you know, the fish hat and the, and the hook and everything, and St. Patrick came by. And, and I got to thinking as I watched him go by in this, in this rather outlandish outfit, I said, I wonder, I wonder how much truth there is to this. So I went home that night and I plugged St. Patrick into the search engine of my computer just to see what I would get. Well, 
to show you my ignorance of terminology from the early church, um, I saw a site that said Confessions of St. Patrick and immediately assumed it was probably some things that the Irish would rather we not know. <laughs> you know, so the, it, it sounded interesting, so I clicked that one and um, it was, it was quite a, a bomb going off in my life because I found um, the same kind of relationship that I had been enjoying with my Heavenly Father existing in this Catholic bishop's life. The confessions of St. Patrick aren't his confession. No. Of the, they are his no, they're confession his, of faith. His confession of faith. They're, they're sharing how his conversion took place and what his walk with God was like. And um, so it was really quite a quite a revelation to find out that he knew the Lord the way hmm. the way I had known the Lord. And I'd been raised believing and had believed all my adult life that um, Catholics were pagal, pagan idol worshipers and really didn't have that kind of living relationship with God. Hmm. And so it was really pretty shocking. And I, the Holy Spirit birthed in me at that moment a need to know. Hmm. I had to understand how that could happen. What did, what did they believe during the time of his life? What was believed then? Hmm. Um, what was true about Catholicism? So, what, so you, here's the start of your journey. There's yeah. a, an openness. There's a crack in the door. Yeah. All right. So I was most of this most of this a private journey at this point. Oh, every, absolutely. It was private for a good long while. Okay. Um, with the exception of there, there what had been a gentleman come to our church and speak, and he he's Protestant, but he had uh, become close to the Catholic Church and had a more objective view of the Catholic Church than most Protestants mm -hmm. do. And um, he had sp he'd spoken at our church, and I remember being very stirred by what he said, but really not giving it a lasting, a lasting thought because it just wasn't relevant to my life at the time. But I knew that there was one person who had investigated the church to some, to some degree. So I, I knew I couldn't go to my pastor because I, I kind of knew what I'd get, you know, yeah. run, repent, stay away from all that. Uh, I knew I couldn't go to my family because I already knew where they stood. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to ask, I already knew. Um, and I didn't really trust Catholics, you know. I mean, I was raised believing y'all are out to deceive people and you're evil. <laughs> so um, I had to know. Evangelize the world with yes. having big families. Yes, you know, yes. So I had to be very careful where I went, and I, I wanted to protect my anonymity. So I, I went and hunting this guy's um, email address and asked to ask questions. Well, little did I know he was in the middle of his own doctoral thesis and extremely busy. But in his selflessness, he he spent time answering questions. And in retrospect, I've looked back at everything he told me in the several months that, that I pretty much picked his brain, and he, he never once uh, told me anything that wasn't totally accurate about the church. Huh. So even though he's not Catholic himself, he was objective. And uh, it just gave me, this is, what, this is what I understand the Catholic Church to believe. And he cut um, church documents, cut and pasted church documents and early church fathers. And, what it did to me really was was show me that my previous beliefs about the church were were based on falsehood that hmm. I didn't really understand the Catholic Church well that increased my desire to understand I just had to know hmm. what was really believed so I had two Catholics in my life um, I had kind of held them at arm's length for quite a while because you know I don't want to get too close to you Catholics <laughs> and um, one of them had been my chiropractor for seven years, and we, I knew he knew the Lord. Um, you can just feel it in people, and this man loved the Lord with all his heart, but um, he was Catholic, so he was a kind of an oxymoron sort of thing in my life, you know, <laughs> the two things that cannot happen. And so I'd shelved him. I'd, we wouldn't even discuss uh, our faith at all. And the other one was a, a lady I worked with, and um, her faith seemed so different than I anticipated Catholics to be so based on faith, so faith-driven, that um, it contradicted what I, what I believed. So anyway, I started to ask isolated questions to the both of them. And then finally one day I just went to my, to my uh, who is now my sponsor, my chiropractor, um, Brad Matson. I said, I need to understand the Catholic faith. Um, would you answer questions if I posed them to you directly? And he said, yes, but I'm not a theologian, but I do have a book I'd like you to read. Well, my back was up right away, and uh, I didn't, didn't want to be evangelized. I wanted to ask questions. And I, I said, uh, well, you know, I'm a sola scriptura kind of person, and if it's not in the Bible, I'm not going there. And he said, I understand that, but it is in the Bible, Patty. Just, just take the book. And I said, all right, I'll take the book, since I knew it was a testimonial. 
I said, I'll take the book, but I also want something authoritative. I want a catechism. And he said, okay. So he went shopping for me, because I would not go in a Catholic bookstore. There's no way, no way, no way. He went shopping for me, and he bought me both. And um, I spent a weekend late in June of 2000 reading Rome Sweet Home and um, having the foundations of my world altered. Yeah, that's the Kimberly and Scott Scott Hans Hans conversion story, right? And also starting to investigate uh, some of the catechism, although I have to admit that it took me a while to read, to read Catholic. Um, it's it's sure. a little different language, so it took me a while to get yeah, used to right. how words are used, but now I, I read it fluently, but at first it was a little difficult. Um, from there, um, I began, uh, I threw down a gauntlet for myself. I, I had read enough and, and been sent enough to know that I was in trouble. I, I was being pushed to a point of, of decision, uh, that there was this incredible drawing uh, going on day and night, mm -hmm. and I knew the Holy Spirit was working overtime. And uh, so part of me was excited, and part of me was, was worried, and, and I knew that the toughest thing I could put myself through was to read my brother's works. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've heard from many a convert since I came home uh, who said that was their last gauntlet as well is right. we knew yeah. the, the toughest thing to get through, if we could get through your brother's books and, and know that God wanted us to be Catholic, there was no doubt in our mind. Mm. And I've had many letters like that. Mm. I didn't know that at the time, but that was the gauntlet I threw down for myself right. as well. So I spent early July um, wading through a couple more of his books, and um, I'd already read the book on Mary earlier. And, and um, it, it was a tough time because the things he was saying no longer rang true. Hmm. I, I knew too much about the faith. I knew what, what I was watching was someone do a very good job of destroying a church that didn't exist. Hmm. Um, no, explain that. That's interesting the way you said that, that he was doing a good job of destroying a church that didn't exist. Well, his, uh, his arguments against the church are based on misunderstanding of what yeah. the Catholic Church actually teaches and believes. Hmm. But he does a superb job of, oh. of defeating the arguments he perceives to be yeah. um, what the church is. And uh, so they are troublesome to a lot of people. And if they don't understand, you know, if Catholics don't understand what they believe or an outsider doesn't understand what the Catholic Church really teaches, it sounds very, yeah. uh, very effective. But That's interesting uh, that that, I don't want to interrupt the flow here, but it's very interesting to recognize that actually that's in many ways what Luther himself did. Yeah because Luther was fighting against salvation by works. So his, his answer was faith alone. Right. When the reality is the church never taught salvation by works. Right. In fact, we, the Catholic Church has said that that's a heresy. Mm -hmm. What he was fighting about against was the way he uh, had learned the Perceived faith it, right. through his Occamism. It's a, the way he was taught the faith, which right. wasn't a pure understanding of the right. faith, which just sounds like it's similar Very uh, much to so. the experience of your brother. So I, I waded through, like I said, a couple more of, of the books, and um, I got to a point where um, I knew, I, I really knew I had to make a decision, and um, I believe there's such a thing as spiritual warfare, oh, yeah. and I really feel that spending time uh, dealing with, with these issues and, and listening to error uh, was really causing me a great deal of distress. So I, excuse me, at one point um, decided that I needed to talk to somebody who'd walked this walk before me. And uh, so I, I uh, called out for help. And I, I spoke for a while with uh, Kimberly Hahn one night on the phone. And um, that was a real blessing because through, through the first, well, the last few months before that phone call, um, I'd had two requests of God. I said, during, I, I know this is of you, I know you're doing this in my life. I, I know, don't know where you're headed with this, but I know this is you that I'm dealing with. I'm asking for two things during this journey. One is peace. Um, I've got to have peace in order to cope with family life and work mm -hmm. and still deal with these issues. And the other is joy because the joy of the Lord is my strength and I need to, to proceed on with life while I do this. Well, when Kimberly and I had talked for about half an hour, uh, she asked if she could pray with me, and I said, certainly. So I, I was a little afraid to pray with the Catholics. I'm not sure how, but <laughs> I let her take the lead so she could uh, take it wherever it will. And, and right away, the first thing she asked the Lord for for me was peace and joy. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, and uh, I just, I realized the Holy Spirit had been, you know, at work and was answering my prayer. Mm. And within a few days of that phone call, the peace and the joy most, most certainly began, began to come as I made a firm decision mm. um, that I was going to delve deeply into studying the, the Catholic faith. Um, shortly after that, I started reading um, A Father Who Keeps His Promises. And um, that, uh, t without a doubt, is, is the most wonderful book on the, on the, the big picture. Yeah. This the covenant reality from, from Adam and Eve to, to the present. Mm -hmm. And my it's family... It's summary of yes. salvation history. Right. It's a wonderful book. When I finished that book, my family and I had been on vacation in San Diego. And uh, it had been a very busy vacation. And I'd been listening to tapes and reading while we were driving. And I didn't think I'd get a chance to, feed it, to finish it on vacation. But the Lord gave me an afternoon, and uh, my husband took the kids and went to the beach, and I was alone with this book. And when I finished, I closed it. I walked out on the balcony and looked up into heaven and said, that's it. I'm Catholic. I'm coming home. <laughs> and uh, that was late in August of 2000. Mm -hmm. An interesting uh, point is that I really had held everybody at, at arm's length throughout that whole situation. Um, it was by email, by someone I, I really don't have a real strong relationship with. Uh, the Hans gave me um, their secretary's email address, mm -hmm. and, and Marie has been my catechist <laughs> for, for a year. But even with her, it was more just information, question, answer, question, answer. really didn't have any close uh, friends on either, on the Catholic side, until my decision was made. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was really made alone. My husband really didn't realize what was going on. Oh, yeah. uh, no one really knew. Hmm. Oh, I'm just curious, what point did the Coming Home Network enter into your story? Of um, that was in February, the following February. Okay. So that allowed you the chance to, again, interact more. Did you go through a phase of uh, finding yourself closer, but then the spiritual battle kicks up, and then all of a sudden you're beaten against the goads, and did you ever have that part of your journey? I think journey? that was July. That okay. was most definitely July. Uh, <laughs> it was a really rough month, but um, August brought final decision and, and peace and joy. Uh, may I ask how your extended family responded to this? At what point did they find out? And, uh, well, I, um, first I sat my husband down, yeah. and uh, that was very difficult. Um, I honestly believe there was a very strong chance of not only losing my husband over it, but possibility of losing my children. I didn't know how strongly he would respond um, to the situation and whether he would act in what he would perceive as protection of them. Mm -hmm. um, I really didn't know where, where his mind was at on that subject. And that's that not subject. an ungrounded fear for the audience to know that that is often a problem of converts from very anti-Catholic families. So I had a, a tremendous fear of losing not just my husband, but, but my, my children as well. And I knew my, my friends were, were history when they found out. And of course, I also knew I would have to face my family. Right. My, my extended family didn't find out until um, October. I had, late in September, I sent out a letter to friends, and, and my friends and my family weren't necessarily in the same circle, so I knew I had a couple of weeks at least before the grapevine kicked in, and I would have to, to make sure I let them know. And I didn't want them to find out through the grapevine. They needed to find out from me. And um, they kind of found out by accident. I used to keep my crucifix in my shirt, and it was discovered one day. And so I kind of on, off the cuff had to explain what was going on. And it was wow. very difficult and very painful, and I felt very... It's very hard to explain because having been on where they are and believed what they believe, I understand the grief of their heart yeah. and I hurt for them. And at the same time, I wish so much that I could give them a glimpse of what it's like over here mm -hmm. so that they would know they have nothing to fear, but they, they can't see that at this point. Yeah. It's very difficult. We've often said on the program that the, the three main issues that stand in the way of people hearing the church's ignorance. They just don't know what the church truly teaches, right? And I guess that might describe a good part of your life, right? You just didn't mm. know what oh, the church no. really mm -hmm. taught. Isn't there? And then there's prejudice, which you think stands in the way. It isn't true, and that was a good example. Right. And then we got that third example of bad Catholics. You know, Catholics <laughs> just don't live their faith very well. Or when they do live their faith as a Catholic faithfully, it doesn't look like a Christian from a Protestant right. standpoint. Right. I mean, that's a problem. And it, when you describe your story, it's interesting that the, 
what got you started was the example of faithful Catholics. Right. That's what right. opened your heart at first. These Catholics are really Christians. Whoa. Right. They know my Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, that reminds us that that's what we're called to do. Our lives are to be a witness so that they do know that we love Jesus and, and that that's why we are faithful in the church. We need to take a break. So uh, please stay with us and come back with a moment with your questions for Patty Bonds and her journey. Your whole life was an illustration of re-examining your eyesight and then taking away the glasses and then seeing the church clearly. See you in a moment. Welcome back. My guest this evening is Patty Bonds. She has been sharing her journey of faith uh, following Christ into the Catholic Church. And as we shared, uh, like so many other converts, it's difficult because you're doing it in the midst of an environment that was very anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. Not just right. the present environment, but your whole life of, uh, that had established these, these lenses through which you looked at Right. Uh, you know, you, when we talked earlier today, you used the example also of the, the telephone game. You want to talk about that? Sure. Um, in junior high, in youth group, we played this game called telephone, and, and someone begins a message uh, by whispering it in the first person's ear, and you got about 30 people in a room in rows, and they pass the message by whispering one to the next. And then for fun, the last person speaks up and says what they heard, and of course it's very hilarious because it vaguely resembles the yeah. first message. And um, I remember at the very beginning of my journey, uh, beginning to discover some things that were um, rocking my foundations as to what was true. Yep. And so I started asking, well, how do I determine truth? And it was during one of these conversations with him about, you know, where do I go for, for truth that I, I called out to him and said, I want to talk to the first few people in line. <laughs> I, I want to ask them what the truth was. And that's when I really started plunging into the early church to find out yeah. what was going on then. And you know, that question isn't an uncommon question amongst, our, well, amongst Protestants. It's just that they limit their sight to Acts, mm. the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. it. Boom. Yeah. And then they jump, you know, 1,700 years or whatever and, and presume that either the church got way off base and was lost or, you know, and all that, mm -hmm. and, and they wipe it all out. But yet the beauty of the early fathers is that you can look at those men and women, men writers mostly, who, who learn their faith at the feet right. of one of the very apostles. Exactly. So, and then, who, then those that they taught. So we can get a very early witness to the right. basic belief. In fact, we have this email which is a little interesting in many ways. Uh, I'm not sure we can answer the question completely, but it's a good one to go uh, from Mary in Michigan. Uh, she says, Dear Journey Home, she says her fairy TV show. Thank you, Mary. I have some friends who go to a Baptist church. They do not consider themselves Protestant because they say their church was the original Christian church going back to the time of Jesus. Any discussions with them are difficult because they say that the reason they don't have any proof of this is because the Catholic Church supposedly destroyed all documents and evidence and made up evidence to support Catholic claims claims to be the apostolic church. Can you suggest anything I could say to them that might help to counter these notions? Uh, thank you, Mary, for your question. Let me ask you first of all, Patty, <laughs> did you ever know any people that believe that way? Um, I, I think uh, having been Baptist all my life, I, I have run into some people uh, with that theory. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like asking someone to, to prove that, that something non-existent doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's hopeless. It reminds me a little bit of, of the Mormon church who, who believes that there was a civilization here on the North, on North American continent, but there's not one, not one piece of archaeological evidence to support it. Right. Um, it's kind of hard to prove that such, a organiza or such a civilization ever existed. We've got a huge body of, of uh, 
early church writings that, that have been accepted, well accepted down through the centuries, and I, I don't see any reason to uh, question by it. By Protestants and Catholics, uh, exactly. as well as secular writers. So a group like that has to really say that every single other person in the world Would is lying. Would have to be wrong, yeah. Everyone else is lying. And you know, what is our answer to that? It's very difficult. How can you, when someone builds their wall, around them right. with these kinds of misconceptions. It's hard to break through. Well, anybody who wants to <laughs> choose to believe something like that has, has made a decision to, uh, to not see in the first place. Right. Um, yeah, or see only what they want see to see. See only what they want to see. see. Let's take our first caller. This is Mary from New Jersey. Hello, what's your question for us? Hi, good evening, Marcus. Hello. Uh, it is a wonderful show, and Thank I try you, never to miss it. Uh, I have a question for Patty. I was fascinated by her description of her, as you called it, second conversion, uh, in which she uh, described uh, almost uh, in terms of going from black and white to technicolor, that sense of really feeling the Lord's presence. And I can relate to that, uh, but I was intrigued by her uh, wording as uh, saying it was a wonderful time and I wonder if that sense that really strong sense of God's presence uh, has somehow um, lessened through the years. Mm. Thank you Mary for that question. Very good question because often uh, one of the issues that people want they, they don't know what that means mm -hmm. if the euphoric feeling goes. Right. What does that mean? And, uh, well, at, during those, those initial years when I was learning to walk in, in what I would call true discipleship, um, obviously I was going through difficult times, so um, I, I wouldn't base the, the reality of that, of that walk on the feelings. Uh, feelings were, <laughs> were mixed at that time. I was going through difficult things mm -hmm. as well as enjoying the intimacy with God. Um, but it has actually deepened in its understanding because now not only do I understand that he's all around me on an almost daily basis I receive his real presence and um, yes there's there's still joy there's great great joy but um, in life you have ups and you have downs and you have to deal with all of that um, yeah. so no it's it's not a it has not passed it has deepened and, and grown in its understanding of what uh, what walking with God truly is, um, but it, as life always is, there's a mixture. Yeah, uh, that, that beautiful passage in Philippians uh, chapter 4 when Paul says, and the peace of God mm. that passes mm -hmm. all understanding, keep your hearts and mind mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. Exactly. It's that peace that passes all understanding. It's right. a deeper. The second conversion that we talk about is not something that we make happen. The Catholic right. writers talk about as a passive thing that that the Holy Spirit through grace does in us. We still have to respond to. Right. But it actually leads to a faith that is stronger and not and not as dependent on our physicality. Right. Our earlier faith is often based more on the doing of things and the going and the feeling and the touching. Mm -hmm. But as we grow in faith, the spiritual writers say that it's less and less dependent right. on that. Can even contain a dark night of the soul, as mm -hmm. John of the Cross yeah, talks Saint about. St. Teresa of Avila went through that for 18 years. That's right. Um, most definitely. Um, and I feel God knows what you need at certain times. Yeah. I remember um, the nine months uh, of the really tough struggling part of, of my conversion to the Catholic faith. Um, the intense closeness of God at that time, and the purpose of that being because he knew I was afraid and he knew I was taking on some very big issues. Um, and it's not that he's not close to me now, he's close to me in a, in a, in a deeper and different way, but he, he knows how to relate to us in different passages of our life so that uh, we have the strength we need to get through what he's calling on us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so like any relationship, um, it, it waxes, not necessarily waxes and wanes, but it grows and stretches with the, with the need of the time. Mm. And um, I think that I would describe it that way more than having faded. I'm going to go to the next email, but before I go there, I want to add one thing to that, because there's so much here we could talk about. But one <laughs> thing I want to encourage the audience as you're walking in your faith, it's easy for us to, it, not easy, but in our spiritual growth, to recognize that something might be a temptation. That might be the devil talking to us. That might be a, some kind of voice trying to pull us away 
we aren't, aren't always ready to recognize, wait, that was the voice of God in my heart. Or that wasn't just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. God did that to help remind me that he is there. And I believe a part of the second awakening, the second conversion, is a more ready awareness to give credit to Jesus when things go well, uh, to recognize God's voice in the events of our life. So look for that. Look for the way God talks to you in your life and, and see God speaking to you in little things. Right. Um, and I would caution her to make, make sure she realizes that you don't run life on feelings. Right. And um, that didn't sound like that's what Mary thought. Yeah. But it's, it was a good corrective that she asked that question to make right. sure that our, the rest of the audience. Feelings need to be, have basis in fact. Right. right. Let's go to our next email. Catherine uh, Asiao. I didn't pronounce it very well. I'm sorry, Catherine. Uh, dear Patty, thank you so much for your testimony. I am a former Baptist as well with family members who are very prominent ministers in the Southern Baptist denomination. Mm -hmm. The backlash from my family has been extremely strong and I have, in hopes of not getting into a family fight, avoided having an in-depth theological discussion with him. Do you have any suggestions as to how I could approach my family without being condescending or judgmental, but in a way that explains the theological reasons why I became Catholic? Thank you, Catherine, for a very good question. Yes, and Catherine, I, I understand your, your situation and your feelings. Um, being less than a year in the church already, I mean, so far, I, I really don't have an extensive amount of experience in relating to my extended family on this subject. We, we really haven't calmed down enough yet to be able to have a really calm discussion about it. I would say live your faith. Um, just live it in front of them. Let them see the joy that you have. Um, make resources available, available to them. I did this with my husband. I said, um, if you would like to understand what's happening to me, uh, here are a couple of books, and I'll just put them here. And then I left it alone. And uh, let the Holy Spirit do the rest. I um, just continued to live and to love and to, and to show the joy that was happening in my life and waited for the Holy Spirit to do yeah. the rest. And yeah. he did. And, uh, of course, I know you, this, this uh, does not need to be said, but never forget prayer, right? Oh, oh. yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's hours one thing we never want to take for granted. Hours right? of prayer, yes. That's right. That's yes. right. Uh, offering up constantly in prayer uh, because conversion happens by grace anyway, right? It's always the work Absolutely. of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that breaks through the barriers of our pride and other things that stand mm. in the way. So let's take our next caller, Greg from Virginia. Hello, what's your question? Uh, Marcus, I love your show. I Thank just want to get up question into Patty here. One of my uh, stumbling blocks as I converted from the Lutheran Church into being Catholic was uh, all the websites and books and uh, different uh, periodicals that attacked the Catholic Church, just so hateful in some sense. And one of the things that gave me comfort was that the Eastern Orthodox churches, the Greek, the Serbian, the Russian, millions of them believe exactly the same thing on the Eucharist, the apostolic succession, the priesthood, confession to priests, communion of saints, and that knowledge, knowing that they believe the same thing that the Catholics do, allowed me to go over a hurdle. Now, my question is, why don't the fundamentalist Baptists attack the Eastern Orthodox churches with the same vigor that they do the Catholic churches? Thanks, Greg. Had that ever come across mm. your mind when you were uh, an anti-Catholic Baptist? Uh, Not really. I, I have a sneaking suspicion of why that might be. I, I believe truly that the, the anger that you sense in, in any anti-Catholic attack or information um, has its basis in an underlying knowledge, for more than likely a subconscious knowledge, that, that they're in rebellion from uh, God's one tr true church. I just find that, uh, especially in ex-Catholics who, who come after the church, there's just this anger. And um, a lot of my Catholic friends ask me, why are they so angry? What are they so angry about? And I said, I think it's, it's the need to justify the fact that they're not home. And um, so there's just a stiff-necked rebellion going on that's, that says, I'm not, I'm not going there, and I will not just submit to that pope. And uh, so you feel that in, in what they have to say, and that, that, that spirit of rebellion, uh, where most Catholics, when they relate to someone of a different opinion, usually do it with, with um, a bit more tolerance of, of various you know, opinions. I, I've never been, uh, oh. never had an encounter with a Catholic that was remotely um, angry like that. Yeah, so. that is, 
and, and of course, the thing is, in America, uh, a, a Baptist could live his whole life and never come in contact with an Eastern Orthodox. It's possible right. because of where they might be living, so it's never as big of an issue. But you're exactly right. Uh, I, I think it's it's Rome is the target because right. of that sense of uh, I'm not going to submit to to what Christ has said. And, and the danger church. is that when any Protestant starts recognizing that Catholics can be Christians, the mm -hmm. uh, validity of other issues, uh, that becomes very threatening. Right. Uh, in fact, that's, I believe, why, and I was there, that we as Protestants could, could believe certain things that logically didn't make sense. Mm. Like the, the sola scriptura, the Bible alone is the authority of our faith. Well, but the Bible doesn't say that. Some might right. go to Second Timothy 3.16, but it doesn't say that. That only says right. that the Greek Old Testament is good for right. teaching. So, exactly. so we're the, if the Bible is the sole foundation, well, then the Bible ought to say that. But the Bible doesn't say that. You know, so <laughs> well, when it comes to the Bible, you can't get past the table of contents without tradition. So um, you know, that's you're, right. you're sunk. That's right. Which, which group of Bibles? I mean, one Protestant leader says that the Bible is a, what is it, a, uh, uh, an errant book of... An errant collection of inerrant books, right. I think is the way it's said. Yeah. You know, a, a faulty collection of faultless books. I forget the words he used, but the reality is, what is that to base a life on? I mean, right. where's the authority? And right. it's just really a tradition, as you said earlier, it's Absolutely. looking through a certain group of, yeah. of lenses. Let's take one more email uh, from Tom Fulton in Nebraska. Patty, it seems to me that many Protestants who come from very strong Protestant families see no reason to investigate other religions or question why they believe the things they do. What in particular sparked you to begin searching? And you're right, and that's, that goes back to the glasses. They're very happy. I was very happy with the way I saw the world. I mean, it, it all made sense to me. I didn't see any need to look anywhere else. Uh, again, the thing that, that really got me thinking was how I could share uh, a walk with God with, with a Catholic um, so identically. And then some other Catholics that I knew in my life, I was beginning to see things in them that that um, I didn't think they could possess. I didn't think there was any way they could, they could know God in those mm -hmm. ways. And just that little crack in the door was enough for me to begin to read the early church. And I remember the first time that I read the words of Ignatius of Antioch about the flesh, you know, the Eucharist being the flesh and blood of Christ. I remember pushing my chair back away from the computer and gasping, I've been robbed. <laughs> and realizing um, I, God challenged me to take off my Protestant glasses and look at the early church without a prejudice and to look at scripture again from a new vantage point. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was through the lives of some Catholics, it was also through um, that sneak peek into the early church um, because of St. Patrick and, right. and his walk with God. Well, as you look now, you've been a Catholic for about a year, or gonna be a year this Easter. Yeah. How has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer to your Lord Jesus? I now have everything that the Lord desired for me. I am now in alignment with the church that he established here on earth. Um, I now know the whole family. I know, um, I know my father and my brother as well as my mother and my brothers and sisters in heaven. Um, I have him on an almost daily basis in the way he in intended for me to receive him, not just in my mind, but in my body and my soul as well. Um, I have everything he, he ever planned for me, and uh, I am forever grateful. Well, Patty, thank you very much for joining us on the journey home, and thank you for your witness, and our prayers will continue to be with you, because I, I know from making the same journey that following Christ can sometimes bring sadness mm -hmm. as well as joy, uh, because it sometimes forces us to make decisions different than our culture or sometimes our family. So our prayers will be with you. Thank, thank you. you for sharing. And thank you for your continued work with others who are on the journey as you work in the discussion group at the Coming Home Network. So thank you very much. All right, stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some closing thoughts for the journey home.
Welcome back to the Journey Home. Pandy, you want to say hello to a few folk at home? Yeah, I did. I wanted to thank those uh, brothers and sisters of mine at St. Helens Parish in Glendale, and also all my brothers and sisters on coming home. They've been great, and but especially to my husband, who has really become my hero. I love you and welcome home. And um, my children, Kimberly, right. Sarah, and Esther. Thank you, Pandy. Just as a, a closing thought, you know, Jesus made a, a kind of a bold announcement to his apostles when he said that when they followed him, they might have to make choices in their life between family and friends, uh, that if they were to follow him, they had to be willing to follow him no matter what, no matter what they might leave behind. And that's often difficult to do, of course. Uh, one of the reasons that our work in the Coming Home Network exists is because many of the men and women, when they decide to become Catholic, are leaving their jobs and their, uh, as well as their friends and family, and it becomes a difficulty. But one of the things that I wanted to say on the other side uh, is that uh, in our journey of faith, uh, God blesses us ways that we could never know. Uh, I remember when I was faced with that issue of leaving the Protestant ministry to become Catholic, I wondered, what would I ever do? I mean, this was my whole understanding of myself and who I was and what my calling was. I've told you audience before that I remember sitting in my basement wondering if I'd ever have a pulpit again. Well, here I am on television talking about Jesus around the world. I mean, God has a wonderful sense of humor. God always can outbless us. He can always answer our needs more than we can ever imagine. The issue is trusting him. What is it that stands in the way of us truly following Jesus our Lord? Our theme for tonight was seeing through the right lenses. And the danger is that we might be blinded by things that we've accepted and never examined. We might be blinded by the pressures of family, the opinions of family, the pressures of our neighborhood, maybe our job or our culture. But Jesus calls us to, remember what he calls us to look at? Look at God's creation and how God takes care of it. Call us to look at God's gifts that he gives us through his people through his church, and through the work of the Spirit. We walk on this journey together every week, and I thank you for joining us. Let's keep each other in prayer, because the decision to follow Jesus is not always easy, but is always full of love, joy, and peace. God bless. See you again next week.